Okay, let's bring in to the discussion Gabriel Young. He's the secretary of a group in the United States called, called Filipino Young Professionals. Welcome to Storycon, Gabriel. Thank you for joining us again. Gabriel is a Democrat for everybody who cares to know. So, Gabriel, what do you think about uh, <laughs> Ronald's uh, assessment that, you know, uh, Trump seems to have uh, no, uh, perform, outperformed Kamala Harris in this morning's debate? This morning here in the I, I 100% absolutely disagree there that <laughs> Donald Trump outperformed Kamala Harris. And the reason behind that is that what we saw was Donald Trump was on the offense, uh, defensive, actually, most of the time. Mm. It was Kamala Harris yeah. who was on the offensive. However, where I think we are skewing it is by perception. Whereas Donald Trump's uh, aggressive tone, his candor that he is a stronger leader, is what came off. Everything he spewed was very hate-fueled, very aggressive. He was targeting certain people. He was pointing the fingers out. Whereas Kamala Harris, being the lawyer that she is, was very diplomatic. And what we, I would say, see is that there are two conceptions of leadership present. Kamala Harris is an inclusive leader, or views leadership as inclusive, where she wants to be a president for all people. Whereas Donald Trump, he wants to focus on the idea of bringing back an old America. For me personally, I believe that this old America is the one that's founded on racism that we've seen from the old constitution in 1789 and the different Jim Crow laws and racist laws that have came ever since, but only until Democrats have came into play to repeal those. And so therefore, while Kamala Harris did not give that punchiness that people expect Trump to have delivered, I believe that Kamala Harris outperformed Donald Trump in being civil, in being knowledgeable about the policy, and also providing a path and framework for the future. Whereas I, Donald Trump only provided ones that he can claim from before. I fully agree, uh, Gabriel, with your points. <laughs> and uh, uh, to clarify, uh, I'm more pro Kamala Harris. <laughs> I have never been pro-Trump. I'm only saying is that uh, Trump played the populist uh, playbook. Now it's a it's a playbook he's been using, and uh, as I as I said, it's only a battle between for those five swing states. Now and those five swing states, it's a battle for the three percent undecided. It will be a race or ten uh, battle. Now and uh, the strength of Kamala is that. He, she is uh, about uh, values, about principles, you know, about unity, about the future. But uh, the populist playbook is also very compelling in a very polarized America. So like uh, two of the swing states are in the border. So immigration will be an important issue for those, for those two states, two, uh, two swing states. So what I'm saying is that uh, uh, Kamala wasn't able to destroy uh, Donald Trump. Uh, of course, it's a different uh, uh, debate from the Biden-Trump uh, debate, much better. But I was expecting more in terms of uh, destroying Trump from the side of Kamala. So I guess, Gabriel, what uh, Ronald's uh, point is, uh, if we're looking at those five swing states, um, his his. He's arguing for the case that uh, it seems that Trump may have uh, connected with those five swing states more than Kamala Harris. I'd argue otherwise, and the reason for that is that when we're talking about immigration, for example, whereas Trump has really focused on his plan to deport 11 million people in the United States, what we saw in the debate, embarrassingly enough, is that he could not answer if he had a plan or what that would look like. We saw the moderators, pre moderators press upon him. Are you going to have law enforcement go door to door? And instead, Donald Trump deflected that answer. And so what we saw also, similar to Donald Trump's health care uh, question, was that he has concepts of a plan, but he doesn't actually have a plan. On the flip side, where Kamala Harris came to play with immigration, was she talked a lot about her own family being immigrants as well, and about the challenges that it's had, whereas Trump, again, has only highlighted the negatives of, of immigration. Plus, where Kamala Harris also did beat Trump, in my opinion, was the big focus of her assignment was to pursue that bipartisan immigration bill. However, 
where Vice President Harris really nailed it down was that Donald Trump's making calls to Congress to tell people to shut the bill down actually happened, and therefore the bill never came to fruition. Uh, there were multiple reports that it was a bipartisan bill, there was Republican support behind it, but Donald Trump killed the bill, and he did not answer why he killed the bill. He just then shifted the conversation and really showed that he does not have answers to the questions people want to know from him. All he wants to talk about is the number of people at, at her rallies, um, about being in Springfield and them eating dogs and cats. But um, Kamala Harris actually talked about that she would want to either reintroduce that plan that was discussed, but also throw in her own spin on it as well. Uh, whereas Donald Trump, again, has absolutely nothing. And therefore, I think if voters want answers, they will find it in Kamala Harris. However, when we're talking about these swing state voters as well, I think there's one thing important to recognize is that within these swing states, there are also a lot of disenfranchised and disengaged voters. And I think that's where the tipping point is, where they would want answers to their own questions. However, those voters who probably either A, would want to find and seek the truth, would find it in Kamala Harris, or B, would want to dive into simplistic narratives that they can only see themselves and therefore would go for Trump. And what we're seeing right now is a vote for registering those voters and the more um, that you can outreach to those voters as well. And so I wouldn't necessarily say that it wasn't exactly tipping point for Trump, but it's more so how were you able to reach the narrative that people were watching at home? And I think both were reaching two different narratives that are playing wow. households in those swing states. And therefore it's inconclusive to say that one outperformed the other in those swing states. Uh, but Gab Gabriel, to Ronald's point, is there strong concern among Democrats, you think, uh, that we are seeing a repeat of what happened when Donald Trump faced off with Hillary Clinton? Because as Ronald pointed out, uh, Kamala might win the popular vote, but uh, we might all be surprised again with the Trump victory in the Electoral College. Uh, to add to Ami, uh, Gabriel, again, mm. I agree with you. No? Uh, Trump is a liar. Trump has no plan. <laughs> no? But Trump uh, caters to emotions. Hate, yeah. fear, third world war, no? uh, uh, illegal invasion, no? uh, et cetera, et cetera. She, and and uh, as we all observed this past uh, decade, that has some traction. No? Uh, that's the problem. Will voters be intelligent enough no, to look beyond the lies, to look beyond the absence of a plan, to look beyond emotions, especially in those five swing states? Definitely. So going back to the question of, uh, Amy, could you repeat your question one more time? I, yeah. I had it at the yeah. top of my head. No. Yeah. Oh. You, you think we're, we're seeing a repeat? We might see a repeat of what happened when Hillary Clinton faced off with Trump. We were really surprised that she won the electoral vote, by, uh, but I mean the, the popular, popular vote, vote by millions, and suddenly here's Trump, he becomes president based on the electoral vote. I mean, I, people are talking about this again, this scenario after watching the debate. Is there a strong concern within the Democratic, uh, uh, well, Philippine, Filipino community of Democrats. Is there a strong concern that this might happen again? Are we seeing this again? Yes, there is 100% a fear amongst Democrats right now that another mm -hmm. Clinton incident might happen. And particularly mm -hmm. what we saw in 2020 were the disenfranchise of those who didn't like either Trump or uh, Hillary Clinton, uh, not, not 2020, uh, going back to 2016. We, they didn't like Trump or Hillary, and so they didn't vote at all. And what we saw despite that popular vote was that in states such as Florida, um, it allowed Trump voters to prevail and therefore have the Electoral College swing in Trump's favor. When in reality, I know you all were talking about population centers earlier, yeah. that popular vote was really um, was really in full force for Hillary. So there is that real, um, real full fear. But I think that's what is different eight years later this time around, that those same people who are disenfranchised are now recognizing the impacts of their disenfranchisement. I'm not necessarily putting the blame on those voters, but there's a new uh, conversation that's happening in the United States. For example, when we look at the Israel-Gaza example, mm -hmm. 
we see that many voters are afraid of wanting to go either Trump knowing that he's pro-Israel, but also going to Kamala knowing that she's a little pro-Israel, but also still pro-Palestine. So on the question of will people be willing to look to the facts, I think people are starting to become more civically engaged because we saw what happened in 2016 with Hillary Clinton. And therefore, there are many um, people amongst the youth, amongst my age group, who are actually willing to look to the facts now, whereas those who are older voters, whether that be boomers or Gen Xers, tend to be phasing out of the voting demographic, and therefore young people tend to be the decision-making votes now, or let alone minority people of color who are recognizing that they really do have a stake, that they're actually wanting to be enfranchised again to actually vote, and therefore are willing to look at the facts rather than uh, buy into the misinformation, disinformation. So Gabriel, the needle is changing uh, towards Hillary, that was your point, uh, because they've learned from the Hillary defeat before. But the problem is the polls I saw in this, uh, in this swing state is that 75% of the concern is about inflation and about immigration in Migration. all the five states, 75%. Uh, the strength of uh, Kamala, for example, about her productive health, is not reflected in the, in the polls. It's a very small consideration. Political extremism is about 20, 25%. Now, gun control is about uh, uh, 20%. And uh, the, the question about reproductive health, health care, which is the strength of Kamala, is not very high in the swing states. Will this debate change that? I definitely think it'll change that mm. because what we saw again was that Kamala had the plan, but then oh, Donald Trump just didn't. And while there were so many issues to go forth, I think it was also on the performance as well that while Kamala didn't emphasize it as much, is that she still had the plan. And what I'm also seeing from the Kamala campaign versus the Trump campaign is that they're going out into these swing states and making sure that folks are educated within the policy portfolios that Kamala's talked about, um, whether that be inflation and immigration. Primarily today, one thing that I'm really uh, excited about that the Harris-Waltz campaign did is they released a fact sheet for Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander communities. And they're now doing their best to develop fact sheets for each state so that whenever they go into these states, they can actually read about the issues that are impacting them. And so with inflation and immigration from this debate, while inflation wasn't a huge topic uh, or explicitly stated, Kamala Harris did advertise her Opportunity Economy Plan, which talked about the benefits that voters in the swing states can pursue um, with that $6,000 child ta uh, tax benefit or with the small business side of things, the 125000 tax credit as well. How much will that resonate with people in the swing states? I think that is yet to be seen. However, it is already out there that, again, Trump doesn't have a plan. So at least voters in the swing states are able to decide whether they want to vote for someone with a plan or vote for someone based on their emotions. And, and the demographics of these swing states, again, these border states, they tend to be mixed amongst the electorate. They tend to favor older boomers who are there for retirement, such as looking at Texas and people who don't want to pay income tax. Um, but then there's also a growing electorate of youth and Gen Z who are moving the needle towards Kamala and doing their best to fight the misinformation, disinformation on social media. Um, there's currently candidates right now, actually a Filipino American candidate over in Texas who is doing just that in her campaign for the state house. And so that's why I am, I am a strong believer that Again, the youth and those who will be looking for a plan, who are the new upcoming generation of voters, will definitely fill in that gap where the older voters are voting on their emotions. Gabriel, uh, where, where does the Filipino, how, do, how, how is the Filipino community divided in this election? Can you give definitely. us a, a, a picture or an idea? Or are there uh, surveys yeah. uh, expressing that division? Definitely. Um, so for one, in my own academic study, I conducted my own survey in partnership with a nonprofit called Lead Filipino that um, measured where Philams lie on the political spectrum from last year, although um, it might be one year old. What we found was that, again, those who tended to be older Philams or those who uh, 
who are more first gen or second gen immigrants and tend to be on the conservative side whereas okay. the youth and those whose families have been here in the US for, for fourth and fifth generations tend to be on the liberal side of things and so how that's playing out here is that what we're seeing is on the west and east coast there's the heavy Democrat presence um, that is both young and old. Whereas on these flyover states, the Midwest, it remains up for grabs due to the feelings of wanting to belong. Moreover on that, so back in 2020, there used to be Phil Amps for Biden and there used to be Phil Amps for Trump. But this year what we're seeing is that on the Democrat side, there was a stronger organization, uh, organization of Filipino Americans in coalition with Republicans for Harris who are pushing back against a Donald Trump presidency. And what we see is that there's a high sway and movement towards the Harris Waltz camp with more Filipino American DNC delegates than there ever were GOP delegates this year. And so therefore many Filipino Americans are starting to lean towards the DNC out of fear that another Trump presidency will do more harm to the country than good. Okay. What is the appeal? Ibram, would you have any specific numbers? Would you have any specific numbers among Filipino Americans? How many are Democrats and how many are Republicans? Because we get the impression that there are more actually who are Republican. Uh, is that an accurate perception? Even in just indicative, just indicative, not that uh, yes. don't have to... a ballpark yeah. figure. Yeah. 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 A ballpark. Give me one second, because there is this organization called uh, AAPI Data and API yep. Vote, and they held an exit vote survey on where people lie on the spectrum of their um, pool of candidates. So I'm pulling that mm -hmm. up right now. But from previously uh, in the 2020 election, what we saw particularly, okay, here I have the numbers. What we saw was that around 60% of Filipino Americans mm -hmm. tended to be tended to be a uh, Democrat, whereas oh. there's around 20 or 30 percent who tended to be uh, Republican. And then there was this 10 percent undecided. OK, so in their most updated voter survey with a sample pool of 2,479 respondents, 45 percent of those who identify as Filipino tend to be Democrat, with 21 percent as independent. 28% as Republican, and then 3% as an other party, and 2% as a don't know. So what we're seeing is that Filipino Americans are starting to lean more Democrat over time. Um, and my, while this is just a sample poll survey, uh, it's a decent reflection of where the overall population is looking at for the okay. lambs. Okay, what is it about Trump, uh, Gabriel, that appeals to, you mentioned a while ago, that appeals to uh, older generation of Phil Ams, and I'll ask you at the same time, Narena, what is it about Kamala Harris or the Democratic Party that appeals to a younger generation of Phil Ams? Because that seems to be the division where the line is drawn. And uh, added to that, uh, Gabriel, is what is, what is the 21% independent? Because uh, usually there's no independent candidate. If there is, it's a, a marginal independent candidate. So what does independent uh, preference mean in your survey? So in the sur it, it's not my survey. Ah, it is okay. um, APIA vote and AAPI <laughs> data survey. So uh, these results can be found online. And what that translates to is um, this survey was more measuring party identification than actually which candidate you're going to vote for. And yeah. As we all know, people tend to vote with the parties that they identify with. And so there are certain states, such as here in California, where you can register as an independent, but then you can still vote either blue or red. So it's really an up in the grabs answer. Um, so to the previous question about why are older generations tending to lean more Trump versus younger generations towards Kamala is because of the generational experiences and probably immigration experiences. A lot of older generational Filipino Americans bought into the American dream and the pull yourself by your bootstraps idea mm -hmm. that anyone can make their American dream happen. However, on the younger generation side, what we're seeing is that American dream is really false. And we're seeing that with that inflation, the high rates of housing prices these days, and let alone the unaffordable cost of living. And so the older generation tends to complain that young people don't know how 
easy they have it, whereas there's so many resources available. Um, and that's what they buy into with the Trump campaign is that they're, there's this want to make America great again, that idea that anyone can pull themselves up by their bootstraps. However, on the younger side of things, um, especially with the culture education that's presented to Filipino Americans from ethnic studies and the Third World Liberation Movement, we're seeing that there's this critical thought that America as built as a racist country is inherently broken as an institution mm -hmm. and doesn't enable that social mobility that older generations say so. So there's that little um, clash between older generations and class that is coming to the forefront. That younger people feel that because things are so unaffordable that they don't have a place in society, that they find a place in the Democratic Party um, that aligns with the Filipino American identity, that has the history of labor issues that Filipino Americans have fought for, or then immigration that Filipino Americans have also fought for as well. Whereas on, again, the Republican older generational side, that since they were able to make it, regardless of their own identities and the issues that were at the forefront of the Filipino American uh, historical movement, that they want to buy into the racially blind party, if you will. How about reproductive health, Gabriel? Especially for Filipino Americans, because the Filipino Americans are very Catholic, very religious, uh, and reproductive health is the strength of the Democrats, of Kamala. But uh, is this strength reflected in the Filipino community? Because uh, whenever I'm there in the US, that's an issue which uh, some Filipino Americans are raising against the Democrats about abortion, about reproductive health. So how is that playing in the Filipino American community? I'd say it's another generational yeah. uh, conversation. So a lot of the first gen immigrants who carry the beliefs over from the Philippines, particularly that Catholicism belief, yeah. still believe in that single issue voting stance of um, being pro-choice versus pro-life. However, what we see is that their children, the first generation Americans or the second gen Filipino Americans are the ones who tend to lean towards the reproductive health side of things. Uh, one anecdote that I can share is that when Filipino American gangs were really prevalent within the United States, um, particularly if you look at Cerritos, California, for example, teen pregnancy was a huge conversation and occurrence for Filipino American women. Um, and however, it's those reproductive health issues of those who recognize the, the opportunity to choose about their own bodies and break away from the old Filipino notions and within the Catholic Church we're able to recognize that and therefore why second gen and third generation Filipino Americans tend to lean more into the reproductive health side of things than first generation Filipino Americans. Another thing on the first generation side of things, I believe there's also a split now. What we see a lot within the Filipino Americans for Harris community is that the first gen Filipino Americans um, are now majority women as well. And those women who are recognizing that their beliefs are really founded within the Catholic Church and then within the old beliefs of the Philippines, recognize that they actually have an opportunity and choice in the United States and therefore why some of them are breaking away and now joining more so on the Democrat side because these women can see themselves in the party that feels that they um, feels that a party represents them and their own issues. Okay. April, uh are the Filipino Americans active voters? I mean, is the turnout typically high among the Filipino Americans during elections? During elections, no. So a lot of Filipino Americans uh, tend to be disenfranchised or tend mm. to be very disengaged, especially first generation Filipino Americans, um, especially that a lot of us carry that cultural trauma that being civically engaged has or we don't see ourselves being argued in the policy that the candidates are arguing. And so therefore, what we're seeing now amongst this generation, there's this new article that came out from NBC Asian America that says that um, Asian American as a whole, uh, voter registration rates are rising and the Filipino American population is a part of that as well. And so there are a lot of movements to go out into communities. There's actually a lot of grant funding also for nonprofits to go out into these communities, register voters, uh, particularly also Filipino Americans, and making sure that they're turning out at the polls and improving, um, improving the low turnout rates from before.
Is this uh, election, Gabriel, also polarizing the Filipino community? I mean, uh, we just had an election in 2022, and we, we saw divisions, deep yeah. divisions, and polarization uh, among Fili even Filipino families. So uh, does this election have the same polarizing and divisive effect on Filipino families, on the Filipino community? Yes, it definitely does. And I can even speak from personal experience. I have people on both sides of the spectrum. I was raised conservative. I became liberal over time. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of my family uh, itself is feeling its own polarization. And transforming that into the larger community uh, magnifying glass is that we're seeing that across the board. However, what is different about this year versus 2020 is the organization strategies. As I mentioned before, there is no Filipino Americans for uh, Trump and Vance, uh, but there's Filipino Americans for Harris Waltz, and then also Filipino Americans in the coalition of Republicans for Harris who are joining there. And so while there is that polarization on the ground within our own communities, we're not seeing that reflected in the actual organization or political organization, I should say, uh, that is elevating upwards and doing the fundraising strategies. So what we're seeing there is there's a lot of Filipino Americans who are actually out fundraising for Kamala Harris and then there actually is Filipino Americans fundraising and door knocking and canvassing for Donald Trump and J.D. Vance. Okay, Gabriel, this is the second presidential debate for this uh, elections in November. Of course, the first one was with uh, President Biden. And possibly uh, the last. We're just curious here. Uh, the perspective from Manila is that uh, U.S. elections are all about uh, the effect on our dispute with China, for example. And yet we notice that there are no questions on China. Is this because, uh, as far as China is concerned, there's no disagreement between Republican parties and the Democratic Party? Or is this because uh, it's, it's a non-issue as far as the American public is concerned? Because uh, about a couple of months ago, Trump said that uh, uh, he won't depend Taiwan if he's president militarily. Uh, and Biden said two years ago that he will defend uh, Taiwan militarily. And, no? and, and, and yet, yeah. Ronald, yeah. it's nowhere. And, all this is China it is wasn't not part of the debate. No, it's not part of the debate. Uh, Ukraine was, uh, Afghanistan partly, Gaza, Gaza is, uh -huh. but no, not much mention about China, the, the hub of the world, the South China Sea. No, the the conflict between the two biggest economies and the two biggest armies in the world. No. Which so what's the public sentiment in, in uh, the American public and in American media? Is this a bias of the American media or uh, there's really no sentiment in, in, as far as the American public is concerned? It's not it's a, a, voting, a voting issue. Yes. Is there bias or is there sentiment? I believe there is sentiment amongst the American public, but there is a lot of media bias. Uh, right now, what we're seeing also on these voter issues is that people are really putting the magnifying glass over the Ukraine-Russian war and mm -hmm. Israel-Gaza because of the budget that is going to that. When we're talking about all these other government programs that aren't being funded, we're seeing that it's on the flip side, the Department of Defense is selling uh, millions and millions of dollars into going into Ukraine and also uh, Israel-Gaza. On the flip side, the China issue and Asian security is not a hot war. It's currently a cold war that's still war. festering yeah. um, in people's minds. And therefore why I wouldn't say that Democrats and Republicans agree about it because as you all mentioned, Donald Trump, albeit during his presidency, was very adamant about defending Taiwan, has switched his stance now and seen that he wouldn't defend Taiwan, and particularly um, out of fear for the economic impacts that would have. Um, Additionally, what we saw under a Trump presidency was the high tariffs towards China that caused many supply chain issues that eventually came up during COVID-19, whether that be with getting masks, with uh, getting information about the COVID-19 virus. Donald Trump stowing that soft uh, tension between China and the U.S. has really sparked the inability to communicate. And we even see, see a similar conversation within the Democratic Party as well, whereas during uh, APEC back a few months ago in San Francisco, 
Joe, President Joe Biden on record said that he still sees Xi Jinping as a dictator despite having a productive lunch and conversation with him. So where I all both Democrats and Republicans do agree that China is an issue, it's not the number one issue because we don't see the budgets being poured over for a hot war over there. However, what I do agree with you all on is that that is a area that I'm very disappointed on that uh, US Asia relations aren't at the forefront of voters right now and especially knowing that China with being the second biggest economy in the world is coming after the US's uh, the US is thrown at number one is an issue that definitely people should pivot on um, but it's just not a hot topic right now within the polls or anything um, I think another issue with T talking about China as well has been the rise in anti-Asian hate as well and so both parties don't know necessarily how to conduct messaging around it that is culturally sensitive um, or that voters will care about. Currently all the other voter bases don't really care about China but then the Asian American base does. However, Asian Americans such as myself still feel invisible at times when both parties are presenting their foreign policy plans. And so what is one area that I believe that either campaign can improve on is definitely addressing the U.S.-Asia relations and security issue and that will definitely be an issue that many Asian Americans um, including the Filipino American community can latch on to in the future um, especially that a lot of young Phil Ams are really interested in foreign affairs and how uh, the U.S.'s trade relations um, bi and bilateral relationship with the Philippines impacts their own cultural upbringing here in the U.S. Okay, uh, I, I guess we should take that as something good that it was not discussed in the debate because that means it's not a big problem, <laughs> right? We should well, take that as a positive. Last question, Gabriel. Yeah. No? Trump said that if he doesn't win, there will be blood in the streets. No? So uh, in a way, it's a message that January, January 6th incident will be much bigger if he doesn't win this election. No? How much of a threat is that in American society? Uh, this is the first time that the problems of America, like January 6, happened in America. It used to happen back here. It used to happen with the third world, with the global yeah, south. Pe people are saying it's a, <laughs> uh, it's a banana republic. Now it's, it's happening it's in looking the like a banana republic. The decision yeah. of the Supreme Court to give the president immunity from almost anything is something uh, defining nowadays. So uh, this threat of Trump. If he wins, he became become authoritarian. If he loses, there will be blood in the streets. Is this real? Yes, there is a very real fear that with with not electing Donald Trump back into office that there wouldn't be another peaceful transition of power. We saw that within the debate as well. The moderators asked the election is in 56 days and would you um, participate in a peaceful transition of power and Donald Trump did not answer that fully at all. Um, he instead blamed again Nancy Pelosi, DC Mayor Muriel Bowser and everyone else for not ordering the National Guard to come in when in reality while it wasn't fact checked on ABC the National Guard can only be ordered through the, de through the Department of Defense which can only be ordered from the Commander-in-Chief. And so Trump had every opportunity to do so on January 6th and therefore every claim that he talked about that January 6th was a peaceful transition um, is falling false on deaf ears. Uh, whereas Kamala Harris who talked about being at, at the Capitol on January 6th that there is that real sentiment that it can happen again. That there is a huge fear that with the racial divide in America that it can happen again. And whether that we see with the division that Trump was infusing in the debate with t blaming immigrants and then um, encouraging people to quote unquote take back their country through making America great again that there's a fear that there won't be a peaceful transition of power and that there actually may be a bloodbath additionally referencing the bloodbath too Trump talked about um, getting rid of people within the government who doesn't align with him and I know project 2025 was a small talking point tonight and while Trump does try to distance himself from it the policy of kicking people out within government and replacing them with his own presidential appointees is already an idea from project 2025 that he has already started considering while he didn't outright say that it was and so this bloodbath of removing people who disagree with him um, figuratively a, a figurative bloodbath 
is something that he's even considering to reshape Washington, D.C. and quote-unquote drain the swamp of what he sees. And so there is that fear that it's not just going to be a peaceful, violent transition that might lead to political violence and um, and families fighting against each other once again, but also within our own government, that he is able to reshape the entire government to make sure that it can uh, look into something more that falls in line with this political philosophy than anything else. Okay. Ami? Gabriel, after this final debate, uh, uh, after this debate, are you expecting a third and final one to happen? Is it more unlikely now, or are you still seeing one more? I want to be very optimistic that a third debate yeah. will happen, but I am feeling a bit pessimistic and cynical because of how hard mm. it was to even get Donald Trump on the debate stage. Once the mm. campaign shifted from Biden to Harris, we saw that that Donald Trump at first was saying that he doesn't want to debate Kamala Harris because he didn't view her as the pro uh, proper candidate. And so mm. looking forward now, as we near into November, I would really like to hope that there's a third opportunity for both of them to go at it again, but then also um, shed more light or even a spotlight to a vice president debate where we can see J.D. Vance go up against Governor yeah. Tim Waltz and see where it's more on the policy front of things away from the national spotlight and personalities that take up Kamala and Trump and that we can see a more uh, concrete policy debate at play. Okay, uh, Gabriel, you're a Democrat. Was there something you would have wanted to hear or, or uh, hear Kamala Harris say in the debate earlier today? I don't think she responded stronger enough to Trump talking about her own race and identity um, with her deciding and transforming to be black because I think that is something that she knows, and definitely the Democratic Party and people have that education to know that you don't choose the race that you are. You just so happen to be it. And so by Kamala not taking a stronger stance towards uh, towards protecting racial identity and eventually how that has its impacts on civil rights is something that I wish that she definitely would have uh, taken a stronger stance on, especially in the wake for us Asian Americans as we we're seeing that. Uh, the Supreme Court's case against affirmative action and with it being struck down. Race is such a prevalent conversation within the liberal community that we hope that um, President Harris would speak so. One of the, uh, or Vice President Harris. One of the big issues that we saw with the Obama administration, for example, was that while he was the first black president, he didn't speak for all black communities, especially the socioeconomic disadvantaged ones that were impacted by racially unjust policy in the, in the past. So for Harris to come back and make sure that she is making her uh, policy to address racial inequities much more, that would be such and a pivot point. Okay. Thank you for joining okay. the Storycon today. Gabriel Young of the U.S. group Filipino Young Professionals live from Berkeley, California. Thank, Thank you, Gabriel. you, Gabriel. Hope to see you again back here.